How would you describe yourself? I am a lover of science. I invest in and help start companies. You have such a unique childhood story. I grew up in New Zealand. I never went to school when I was a kid. Gosh, I mean, I'd love to go to high school. It sounds like the best thing ever. I think biology is really all about like giving you the choice. What is the hardest part about running a fund? Tweeting. <laughs> <laughs> East Coast culture is very pragmatic, much more detached. And West Coast culture is kind of like, you want to change the world? Of course you can do. Who says you can't? You know, you can do anything you want. It's the West Coast. Talk to us about mathematical intuition or in biology. Mathematics is a whole wild discipline. In my mind, it's like art or something that I barely understand. Hey, Laura, welcome to The Good Time Show. Hey, thank you for having me. It's such a great honor to like have you here on our show, especially live in person. Um, you know, you're, I think, one of our first few in-person guests. And uh, you've come up on our show on the audio version only before as a guest. And we've learned so much about longevity, uh, about, um, you know, aging genetics and the work that you do there and Thiel Fellowship. We have a lot to go cover today. Before we get started, who are you? How would you describe yourself? I am a lover of science. Like, I, I just love thinking about biology and science. And professionally, you know, I invest in and help start companies in longevity. Um, but, you know, I'd really say that I do that through the lens of like, you know, asking what are the tools that we have today that we didn't have in the past and, you know, how th can they allow us to change human health in a really cool, interesting way? That's awesome. Uh, and what do you do right now? Um, so I professionally run the Longevity Fund, which is a fund that invests in companies um, that are trying to make people live longer, healthier lives. That's awesome. You are originally from New Zealand. You moved here at a very young age. Tell us the story. Like, you know, your parents basically moved over here. Why? You know, and what did you get to do once you moved here? Just want to know, like, you know, you, your... you have such a unique childhood story. Yeah. So, I mean, um, you know, I grew up in New Zealand and um, I never went to school when I was a kid. So I was always just learning in our house from textbooks and um, you know, dreaming of this wide world. And actually my dad reminded me recently, I had asked him if I could have a lab when I was a kid. And so I had tried to um, build a lab in our basement and that didn't go so well because we had this really dusty basement and a bunch of glass vials that, and like I kind of, my idea of a lab was like get some glass vials and like colored yeah, liquid. Like beakers, that's literally, yep. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I was not a genius child. I was a very confused child. And um, eventually like that wasn't really working out and so I found this um, woman online, Cynthia Kenyon, who was an aging scientist. And she was one of the few, you know, female aging scientists that I had seen. And she just looked so cool. Like, I remember seeing a photo of her and she was like laughing with like a cowboy hat. And I was just like, I want to be her. Like, if I, if I could be anyone in the world, I'd be this woman, Cynthia Kenyon. And so I emailed her and asked if I could come visit her lab. And of course, you know, I was, this was very inconsiderate of me because, you know, we were in New Zealand at the time and, you know, my parents didn't have a plan to really go to California, but she emailed back like the same day and said yes. And I remember, you know, it's funny. And this is just to visit her lab? Just to visit her lab. Okay. And, yeah. And it's, it's funny because, you know, as an adult, I think um, sometimes our sensations are a bit dulled, right? You kind of go through life and you're like, oh, you know, a good thing happens or a bad thing happens. Yeah. And you don't really, you know, it doesn't really affect you as much. But as a kid, like I remember that moment as one of the defining moments of my life. Like I just ran screaming into my father's bedroom and I was like pummeling his bed with my fists, like just screaming. And he was like, what happened? What happened? Like, <laughs> did you like meet Elvis or something? <laughs> or you know, he, he, didn't, he didn't say that, but you know, kind of just my reaction was really hysterical. And I was just like, no, I'm, you know, this like woman emailed me back and I just my like, I, I can't believe that that happened. And so, you know, later I got to go visit her and actually ended up working in her lab for a couple of years. So you visit her lab. And then how does that change into you working for with uh, in her lab, you moving to the US? Like, how does it all like transpire from there? Yeah, I mean, so th this gets the part of my success that's really due to, or sorry, not success, the, the, the part of my story that's really due to, you know, my parents, which is that, you know, I, I visited her lab and I came back and I was just like, I can't not go back to her lab. Like, I remember walking into her, um, the building that she, her lab is in, and it was this building at UCSF Genentech Hall, which if you are familiar with it, has this three-story high statue of DNA in the atrium. And when I saw that statue, I was like just transported as a child yeah. with awe and reverence for this place. How old were you there? I think I was 11 at that. So hold on. So that is, I think, you might be burying the lead. So you're 11 year old. Um, you know, when I was 11, uh, I was not cold emailing scientists and getting to that. So a uh, couple decades later, things have really not changed here. Yeah, still not. Uh, uh, so that is a remarkable thing for 11 year old to do. How did that happen? 
Well, um, you know, causality is hard to infer. I think uh, when I used to try and answer this question, I give myself a lot more credit. Like, oh, you know, I think I just really was into science and aging when I was a kid. You know, a large part of it is probably due to just, you know, having the kind of family that would raise me in a really weird environment. Like, again, I was raised with no school whatsoever. So I just didn't have any reference point for what was normal. Um, I did most of a high school curriculum by the time I was 11. Um, because I just, you know, like, I just didn't know that you weren't supposed to do that. Like, right. it just, the books were there. And how did that, is it because your parents were homeschooled themselves? Like, you know, it's not a normal, it's not conventional to homeschool children, right? Like, it's not consider the norm. Talk to us about your parents because, you know, they seem such an integral uh, part of uh, the story. Your journey so far. Yeah, my dad is, uh, I mean, I, I love both my parents very dearly. My dad's a really unconventional thinker. You know, he like left school often when he when he was a young man he actually um was a hippie and he went and lived in the woods for a year by himself with no electricity or running water and then he came back and he was like i love capitalism <laughs> like i think there was this sharp shift from like <laughs> hardcore like um commune with nature to kind of like tried that there were too many lice like let's let's try something different um but you know he just i think i'd say he really pushed himself to explore the world and try a lot of different viewpoints when he was younger and he ended up um you know, I, th I think just like having a really original viewpoint. And, you know, sometimes when I read about Richard Feynman, um, I, I, I hear about him talking about his father with like love and admiration and describing this man who just could talk about the world with joy and um, intelligence. And that's kind of how I think about my dad. Like, you know, he really embodied like what I call a Renaissance man, you know, someone who knows a lot about different things and can go really deep. And um, he just didn't, you know, part of his worldview was he didn't see the need for us to go to school by default. He's like, if you want to go to school, you're welcome to, but you don't have to. And we were like, no, we're good. Like, <laughs> yeah. Your dad seems like such a remarkable person. And uh, he, tells you these stories of all these famous scientists, if I remember. Yeah, so I, it's cool that you remember that. Actually, um, he told me the story when I was younger that I think really influenced my reaching out to Cynthia. Um, he told me about this guy who's famous, Michael Faraday, um, you know, one of my childhood heroes, and how Michael Faraday grew up and was actually a bookbinder's assistant when and he was in his younger years. And But he was, you know, passionate about the books that he was reading and binding. And he went to a lecture by, I believe it was Humphrey Davy, and he was so transported by this lecture that he wrote a list of, or kind of this, um, uh, this, this set of notes about Humphrey Davy's lectures and presented and bound it in a book and presented it to Humphrey Davy at the end of his lecture series. And that was how he got to become Humphrey Davy's apprentice. Wow. And I think that's, you know, probably a key part of why I thought it was reasonable to reach out to Cynthia Kenyon. You know, reading, hearing about a teenage, a teenager who was so excited about science that they reached out to their hero and then tried to do something of value to them, um, you know, that, that that was a pretty useful data point that, okay, and then, you know, Michael Freddy obviously had a great subsequent, you know, career as one of the founders of electromagnetism or the, our theories about it. So, yeah. Do you think... Uh you know, it must have been a lot of risk for your parents to homeschool you. Do you think, like, if you just wound up in a typical school education system, you know, causality is hard to infer, but, you know, in your timeline would have been very different? You know, I'd say there's a, a couple of things that I feel are unique strengths of mine. Or they're not necessarily unique, but are, are definitely strengths that I um, feel really strongly about. And one of them is the sense of awe and the presence of science, which I think that might be somewhat innate and also somewhat, you know, from talking to my father about science as a child. But um, another thing is just this deep belief that um, almost any, you know, anything that's like physically possible to do is possible to happen in the world. And the question is just kind of how do you make it happen? And I think that because I grew up in this really different way and then I came to mainstream culture and you know, now all my friends that are, I'm very close to have gone to school, I just kind of um, gave me this perspective of like, you know, living in an alternate world. Like, okay, like I've seen a different way to do some things. It's sort of, and maybe like coming from different cultures would also give you this. Um, and and so I think that that's a powerful viewpoint that I still use a lot. Um, but, you know, apart from that, I, I'm, I'm not really sure. I've <laughs> never gone to high school, so I, I don't know what it would be like. Uh, that's what I was going to ask you next. Do you ever feel like you look at, I don't know, some high school movie and you feel like there was a part of the experience I missed out or I'm like, everyone seems miserable. I, don't, I want no part of that. <laughs> oh, no, totally. I mean, I obsessively watch like high school, you know, um, I think high school musical yeah. as a child yeah. and all, all these beautiful people dancing and laughing yes, together. Yeah. And I think, 
gosh, you know, I'd love to go to high school. That sounds like the best thing ever. That is a very realistic depiction <laughs> of high school life, I'm sure. I mean, that, that and then you know, I'd, I'd watch Harry Potter and I'd think, well, that sounds great too, like all this camaraderie. So, I mean, who, who knows, you know, it might have been great. I mean, I think for us too, uh, you talked about coming from different cultures. It's very similar for us. You know, we didn't go to high school here in the U.S. And so every movie or TV show we watched was like, wow what do they do now like that's amazing that they like even things like you know the pantries and you know like the, the kids drinking coca-cola and we're like what like that's crazy like you know my, my mom would never allow me to do stuff like that um i think especially you know the american high school thing where you had the jocks and the nerds and you yeah. know people had so much time to do prom and have sports sport. like, how do you have time to do sports that's crazy we all grew up uh, you know wearing uniforms to school and uh, so when we watched all these movies and tv shows people could choose what they wanted to wear and we we're like that's that's crazy like how do you do that like how do you choose what to wear and at that time when i was watching all the stuff i used to be like wow that sounds so cool but now in retrospect i feel like uniforms are a really good thing uh because it just lets you like not have to decide i think part of oh, it and uh part of it i feel like um if you are coming from like a background which is like not economically well off uniforms the greatest level setter for you like as a child um it just makes you uh equivalent compared to like other kids and you don't you don't really have to care about do my clothes look okay and all of that stuff so i think it yeah. works itself out uh eventually like later on like now after all these years i'm like actually it was a really good thing that i didn't have to worry about like what i wore to school and all of that uh the, the other okay, so there are two parts of i think you know, the first 10 years of life, which are interesting. Um, by, by the way, it's just remarkable they're doing this as a 10-year-old, 11-year-old. The first is you being homeschooled and basically having the equivalent of a high school education. But I think the second part is you being interested in longevity. I think you say somewhere that, you know, the offer science and the need to go have an impact on it. How did that come about? I can remember a couple distinct things about longevity in particular. So one was um, at, when I was a child, I thought that, you know, like we're talking earlier about Indra and how she has, you know, a lot of interesting questions and stories. And I thought that people lived until they were 10 years old and then they just died at 10 years old. That was my story. And I didn't know how old my parents were. So I was like, I'm, you know, I forget how old I was, maybe uh, six or seven. I'm like, I'm six or seven. My mom seems pretty young. So she must be like eight or, but then my dad would have to be yeah, nine. It's and funny you say that. Indra <laughs> does that too. Like my birthday or the age always is the number of candles she has available at any given time. So she'll be like, you must be six. And I'm like, that's right. How did you know? And we just go with it. Well, that's the interesting th thing though, right? It's like as a kid, that's the way it makes sense is that you have a strictly um, specific allotted amount of time and that's how long you live and then you die. And I remember someone telling me, it's like, no, like, you know, your parents are in their, um, was it, you know, 30s or 40s. And that, that just kind of blew my mind, like both that, that there was that much time available and also the idea that no one could tell me when someone was going to die. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's like, because as a kid, it's like, no, the, you should be able to predict like the number of years in advance. Mm -hmm. But to learn that actually we didn't know the rules that regulated lifespan at all, that was very shocking. Um, and so that was one thing. And then I think another thing is I read an article in the paper about cancer. And I remember telling, I think, somebody in my family, like, oh, I want to work on cancer. And then I think maybe it was my dad said, oh, well, you know, aging is, you know, a bigger problem. You could just work on that. And so it's just like, yeah, sounds good. Like, you know, like that, that was it. That, there wasn't any big. Um, but, you know, I, I think now that I, I see the system more, that, that's about the amount of thought that a lot of people do put into picking what disease they work on, especially starting out in their career. It's just sort of like whatever's the biggest thing that they can think of to do. So I think there are a couple of interesting things that you said here. One is... Um, your dad and then you saying aging as a problem to work on as maybe opposed to just accepting aging as you know the sky is blue or just as a sort of fact of life and how did that come about because that's you know, a lot of people who might be watching this they may not perceive aging to be a problem or something to go work on or as a disease yeah so i want to differentiate very clearly between two different things um there's the idea that death is good or bad and kind of whether death should be a part of life. And then there's um, the idea of aging, which is just the like chronologically, if you have an older, if you're older, you are more likely to have you know, a number of diseases or um, kind of um, you know things that make you feel less healthy or less well. And I think that they're often conflated. And so people say, oh, I don't like 
the idea of anti-aging or longevity because then we wouldn't have death. And I think it's important to deconstruct this because, you know, honestly, at this point in my life, I'm like, I don't know if death is good or bad. You know, it's sort of like that's a question for spirituality that people have been arguing about for millennia. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the older I get, I think the more humble I am about that part of the question. But I think the part that almost everyone can agree on is, you know, if you could be 70 but have the fitness of someone who's, you know, um, younger while retaining your wisdom and your intelligence mm -hmm. and experience, I mean, that would just be great, right? You know, that like no one's going to argue with more health normally. Um, and so basically the idea that you can, um, it, the the only reason that most people don't work on aging then in that context is that it it's not conventionally seen as something that you can affect. But that's really sociological. Like a lot of diseases started out like cancer in the 1920s was seen as like not as much of a problem as it is today. It took a lot of publicity and actually this thing called the Jimmy Fund that specifically publicized cancer with a small blonde child who was very cute. Like it was just kind of this, um, you know, publicity that that kind of made it a, a sort of national problem. I think the same thing just hasn't really happened for aging yet. And it's hard because it's really conflated with a lot of different issues. Um, but, you know, now, now that's kind of how I think about it now. But at the time, it's just sort of like, oh, this is obviously what you'd work on. Like, why wouldn't you work on this? So maybe at a very basic level, when you say aging, what what does it actually mean? <laughs> it's sort of like entropy and physics. Like on one level, I can give you an answer. And then on another level, it's an incredibly complex question. Um, I would say that, um, you know, there's some number of, like, you can kind of, um, there's some number of th things that change with, with, with chronological age, right? And um, there's a lot of things that we'd want to, we might want to keep, like uh, experience or intelligence or wisdom, you know, things that are really, really awesome. And there's some things that change, like, you know, even right now, you know, my friends always joke about how when they drink, you know, they can't just wake up the next morning and feel fine or they can't sleep as little as they used to or trust me every late night or you know, no drinking and, or back pain you know all the things that happen as you approach 40 it's no fun i don't know what you're talking about but okay <laughs> well so that's the thing right? i mean we're we're not yet at the age where you typically spend a lot more time thinking about these types of things but already i noticed that i feel differently than i did when i was let's say 18 and, you know, those are all, I'd say, like part of aging, right? Something's changing in your biology with chronological age. And, you know, parts of that, like wisdom and experience and, you know, all of that we really like and want to keep. And then parts of it that are just like, um, you know, not as fun, like we, we might not want to keep. Like, you know, some number of people like prefer for their hair not to change color and like, you know, decide to dye it back. And then, you know. These might be former presidents of the United States. <laughs> um, I'm not saying that, that one should or shouldn't feel that way, but there's like some number of things where, you know, you just don't like the way your body's changing. And I, I think biology is really all about like giving you the choice, right? Like, you know, do you want this part of your body to change in a certain way or not? And so like, I really view longevity as like just, you know, trying to give people choices about how their body changes the chronological time. And ideally to give them the choice to look and feel however they want. You know, if they want to feel and look, you know, like you otherwise would without any intervention, great. Like, that's awesome. You should do whatever you want. Um, but if you want to retain the functionality that you had when you were younger in terms of like, you know, being able to go all, all night with your friends, like, great, let's give you that. Right. And that's kind of how I think about anti-aging. Like, you know, it's about giving someone choice. You know, I think that's a really great explanation for just aging and what that work really involves. You picked this a aging as such. Um, and, you know, Cynthia, when, when she did her lab work, it seemed like such a, like way ahead of its time. But why then? Like, why was it like so important for Cynthia to do it, for you to like start pursuing it as such at that point? And what's like changed over the years? Like, has there been things that you've like found uh, or like, come up with in the process? Yeah, so I, I'd say, and I, I'm going to give you, I, I guess, a, a pretty um, direct just picture of aging. And that's because, you know, I, I couldn't embellish it. I could kind of say like, oh, you know, like things are amazing or things are not amazing. But I just kind of like, it's a space that attracts a lot of hyperbole. And so I want to try and give a really specific view. Yeah. So aging is really in a special time right now. Um, you know, before Cynthia's work, and her key paper was published in 1993. And before that, there was another paper in I think maybe 1983, and then maybe another one in 1986. Before kind of um, a body of work in the 1980s onward, there wasn't any clear evidence that you could change aging. Um, there were a few papers that talked about things like caloric restriction. So actually, um, some folks during the Depression would starve rats to see what the negative effects were and surprisingly saw some increases in lifespan. And right. so that was really interesting. But, you know, there there were lots of things like that that were kind of smaller increases in lifespan that could kind of be explained away. 
And in the 1980s and 1990s, and what Cynthia really pioneered, um, in part also with Tom Johnson and Michael Klass, what was a series of experiments in this tiny little worm called C. elegans that typically lives to be about 20 days. And she would do experiments with this worm that increased its lifespan um, up to twofold, and eventually in some studies up to sixfold with a bunch of different interventions. And the important thing about that was it's it was so, A, such a striking increase in lifespan, and B, it was just like changing a gene. You know, we, like it was sort of like saying, yes, you know, we change genes to fix a lot of things or to explore different properties. And lifespan's just another property that we yeah. can manipulate genetically. Um, That's awesome. And so that, that was a really important point. And so now we're in the phase of longevity where we're kind of um, exploring the consequences of that. And But I, I think it's important to note that, like, you know, we won't necessarily get, like, you know, many, many decades of extra lifespan in our kind of, you know, current time window. It, it's more like that you'll get any change in the rate of aging at all in a human in our in our lifespan with the drug would be a really huge um like like that that'd be a huge thing on your site i think you list out some the, of the more the promising FAQ? yeah there's a great faq and we link to it in the notes and you list out some of the more promising areas of research and development you talk about caloric restriction you talk about insulin you talk about parabiosis Autophagy, yeah. uh yeah. could you maybe walk us through what are some of the promising areas of research that people are working on right now or you wish people where maybe more people are working on because I think that's another topic too. Yeah, um, you know, I, I wish I was better at kind of giving a really simple model of this. Um, and often I feel like a little bit constrained in interviews because there's so much cool biology, but I think a lot of it isn't under the umbrella of longevity. It's kind of coming from different areas. Um, but I can kind of talk about two different things. So number one is what I described, which is um, all these you know studies that looked at changing single genes and um, corresponding increases in lifespan. And those are really cool, not because they'll necessarily like give us decades of extra life, but because they're um, you know maybe some of those uh, interventions are candidates for the things that would um, be most likely to translate across these barri- the species barrier at all. Um, and so there are things like the insulin IGF one pathway manipulating that. Um, there are things like you know manipulating the mTOR pathway. So I mean, these are just names of genetic pathways that people have changed that increase lifespan. And the cool thing is, you know, we have a lot of drugs that also change those pathways. And so there's this kind of like secret thesis in the aging community that actually there's already a drug out there taken by humans that you know might be affecting their lifespan. Um, and you know we know this is this is probably true to a very very small extent. Just no one's proved it statistically significantly. But, but in what way? By like you know for curing things like Alzheimer's or cancer, but the side effect is that it which it, like it also increases your lifespan. Like in what way would you it you seem to think that there is like a side effect of like solving a major disease where aging is like a benefit as such. Yeah. So I, I'd say like, you know, at at one extreme it's sort of like if any drug had an effect across more than one disease, you know, you might count that as more of an aging like drug than than otherwise. And I think what people really look at when they talk about doing um, studies on aging is this idea of multimorbidity, that you can have one drug push back the like just, you know, average age of death from a variety of different causes in an elderly population. That's very cool. Um, And that hasn't happened yet, to be clear. And we don't know that that is actually happening or will happen. But just, you know, a lot of the drugs that, you know, millions of people take do affect these pathways that have pretty striking effects on lifespan in you know model organisms, and so it's not like unrealistic to think that maybe they'd have some small impact on human longevity. But again, like nothing that kind of like is you know extremely it's crazy out or anything there right now. Yeah, yeah. I want to touch on some of the more philosophical underpinnings of some of this. Uh, I think there is maybe a set of people who hear this for the first time and they go, "Well, aging is just." the natural order of things, you know, you know, you grow up, you grow old and you die. And this just seems unnatural. And for me, the piece uh, which really unlocked this was Bostrom's uh, Fable of the Dragon Tyrant, uh, which is amazing. I'm kind of curious about what you say to people who just say, this is just life and, you know, the way things are supposed to be. Yeah, I mean... um. You know, this is something that I've really changed my mind on over time. I think when I was a child, I would just kind of feel very adversarial. Like, what do you mean? Like, death is obviously bad. Like, why wouldn't we be against death? And now that I'm older, I'm kind of like, I have no idea about death. You know, like, that's a spiritual question. That's not, that's not my realm of expertise, not something I understand. You know, I, I think I think there's this question of, like, are you going to let status quo bias prevent, like, people you love, like your grandparents, from getting, you know, therapies that will help them feel less pain? 
there's no world in which I would accept, you know, um, this idea that things shouldn't change as a reason to not help someone that I deeply care about not feel pain. You know, and that's what we're really talking about. You know, that person may choose to live the same number of years that they otherwise would live. That's completely their prerogative. But the, I mean, the, the real question is like agency over your your own, you know, pain and suffering. And to and you know, to to kind of just accept the societal kind of. Um, default that a certain kind of you know pathology and pain is normal natural is i think just deeply um it's it's just deeply on a humanitarian level like not good um and you know it's also the case that this is changing right so like the fda for example has recently talked about sarcopenia aka like muscle aging as a disease and so what you're seeing is kind of like we're just defining like the aging of each different tissue as a disease one by one. And so eventually, you know, we might just see all those, you know, come into one and then we just call it like in you know, the spade that it is like aging is something that we want to be able to reverse. But I think people, you know, people really conflate um, death and aging and, and kind of those two things in the same mix. And I think they're really different and that's really important. And it's all about just having agency over how you feel. I think we are at the age where a lot of my relatives are in their seventies and their eighties. And, you know, I can sort of, you know, sadly see, you know, the, the decline of their physical capabilities and sometimes, you know, uh, mental facilities. Um, and you can see that. And I, mean, I don't think you're going to ever going to get an argument for anybody about, Hey, you know, these folks need personal life and maybe they live, 20 years, 30 years more, that seems like an obvious good thing. Where it gets maybe more interesting in a sci-fi, maybe philosophical way is, for example, you mentioned an experiment where, let's say we, you know, you're wildly successful and, you know, our kids can live six times a lifespan. They can live for 400 years, 500 years, you know, amazing. I am curious about what do you think the second order effects of that are as a society where you have people, you know, living for 400 years, 500 years, what that means to life. I think it's kind of a deeper philosophical question about does death give you meaning to life and what does it mean where you're near immortal? Yeah, I mean, so I think there's a couple things there. One is um, we'll probably always have death. And, you know, in fact, probably at some point, I mean, people will choose to die. Death will always be around. It's not going anywhere. What we're talking about is having the ability to choose how long you live. And I think I really flipped on this when, you know, at some point I realized we don't live the number of years that we live because, you know, um, some deity picked that number of years as the perfect optimal number of years for humans. Or, I mean, I, sorry, I guess it depends on what religion you subscribe to. But, um, you know, our current understanding is that we evolved, you know, approximately 75 years to an average lifespan mm -hmm. in, like, a very different context than our current society today. Like, there wasn't any concept of, you know, like, even knowledge or, you know, presumably, like, back in the time when this was... And so... There's no world in which this lifespan is optimized for our flourishing and happiness. Mm -hmm. Maybe the optimal lifespan is age 20. Maybe the optimal lifespan is age 200. We have no idea, right? But, you know, like, it's definitely not, like, literally just 75. Yeah. And so I think what we're talking about is the flexibility to, you know, as a society, figure out what that number is mm -hmm. and give ourselves agency to, you know, define our values however we want, whether it's health or flourishing or, you know, something else, and then, you know, pick a lifespan or, you know, individually pick a lifespan, depending on what society you're part of, that uh, accords with that. Um, and so it's just kind of like getting out of that mindset of, you know, like, like some things make sense as a set. Like, I think death may be important as a, you know, part of life. That concept may be very important. I don't think that's going anywhere. But, you know, 75 years in average lifespan is pretty arbitrary. One of the think, really interesting thought experiments is, uh, have you seen Altered Carbon, uh, the book or Netflix? Of, of I course, haven't. Uh, should. I think it's worth a watch because the core concept is, uh, you know, um, humanity evolves to a place where, um, you know, when your body gets really old, you can transfer your consciousness, your sentience into another body. There's kind of a lot of plot points which uh, evolve from that. But one of the more interesting tangential uh, themes explored is what does it mean to, you know, have meaning when you're living for 200, 300 years? How do you keep yourself entertained? Do you get bored, right? What does it mean to go to work every day when you're going to be doing for 200 years? And I am curious about, let us say we decide as a race, hey, you know what? We can live to 200 years. That's amazing. How do you think that might shape the way we work, the way we live, the way we build relationships? You must have thought about that. I'd say if there's one guiding principle for how I spend my time or what I really care about. It's that, you know, there's there's no limit to the depth or the profundity of human experience. And, you know, I, I think in many ways our current society plays into that. Like, okay, you get to, when you're 20, you get to go, or 18, you get to go to college and pick whatever you want to do. And the world's in front of you. You're the protagonist of your adventure. 
And then, you know, later you take your part in society, you have a normal job, you have some, you know, you have wonderful kids, and they become, you know, the protagonists. And your job is to be their caretakers. And, or you know, at least as, you know, someone's kid, that's kind of how my mind used to work. But, you know, imagine that you live, you know, many life, you know, sort of many more times than you, you do today. You know, maybe you then go back to college. Um, you know, I, I was really inspired by watching a speech one time where someone said, you know, what if you're age 50 and you get a PhD? Why not? It's like five years. What are you going to you know, like, What else you can do with your time? Like, <laughs> you know, why, why, why can't the most um, you know, glamorous actresses in our society be like age 55 or even 80? Why can't the best artists, you know, do, do their absolute peak work? And, you know, some do. And they're, you know, right, you know, in their very late career, like in their 80s and 90s. Um, I just think it's such a limitation to kind of put this like, you know, 30 year period of productivity in and say, that's where you do your best work. Mm-hmm. It's like, I mean, it, it completely eliminates the capability of, you know, advancing an idea over, you know, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 years. And I'm just fascinated by, you know, the artistic and kind of scientific creations that will come from that kind of, um, from that kind of uh, time period. It's very really especially true, for example, uh, you know, I don't know how statistically true this is, but there's this theory that the mathematicians, you know, um, do that the are- or chess grandmasters, you know, t- tend to skew younger. There is a period of time, you know, by the time you hit 40, you know, maybe some of your best work is behind you. There are certain professions, um, I think there's a certain class of music, and it, it is fascinating to think about, hey, those folks can now have 20 more years of their prime or 30 more years of their prime, and that seems amazing. Yeah, but also I, I like the fact that, you know, for most people, to what Shuram said, uh, we always talk about time as being like the most non-renewable of resources and where you have this constrained time and you have to like accomplish everything that you ever wanted to do within that time. Uh, whether it's like career focused or anything else, it's like, oh, this is it. Like, don't waste time. Like, that's the thing that you're being told. And I love that you're kind of challenging that assumption where it's like, what if time is fairly renewable? What if, you know, there is no sort of this hard cap on the limit that you get to do, get to have, um, and you can kind of live this life in, in a qualitative way, even when you're much older, uh, which I think is pretty awesome to think about. It's a very profound question. Imagine any of us can think, hey, all of a sudden, if somebody came and told you that, you know, Laura just, you know, funded this amazing thing and you now live for 200 years, what would you do differently? That's a very profound question. Yeah. And, you know, I think also just one thing I feel so strongly about is that there's this in- this huge amount of ageism that we all just put up with, right? Like this idea that, um, you know, being chronologically older means you don't deserve the same optionality that you did, that we shouldn't fight as hard for the health. You know, this idea that like, you've had your time, you know, why don't you let the Pave next generation- the way for the younger generation. More time, et cetera. Exactly. And I, I feel so strongly that that is just one of the worst forms of discrimination possible because the people that we love and care the most about, right, could be doing the best work of their lives. And to assume that it's not our prerogative to enable that and do everything that we can to give them the health and the flexibility to do whatever they would like, you know, at that, you know, whatever time in their lives. I, I just feel so strongly that that's a deeply, it's it's such a deeply um, terrible thing to accept that form of discrimination. You know, we care so much about every other form of equality, but that's one that I think we really leave on the table. Yeah, and I think that comes from this perspective of being zero sum mm-hmm. in your thinking, where it's like finite resources. Yeah. You know, we are on this planet, which has like limited amounts of, you know, air, water, food supply. And it's like, oh yeah, you have to like pave the way for this next generation. You need to stop using all these resources resources so that the next generation can thrive but the right way to think about it is like what if it can be infinite and everyone can have more and and i think uh, like you know everyone can live longer be healthier um contribute to mankind to the development of humanity more and and it's net positive and it's like positive sum game as opposed to uh you know zero sum game as such i think that's it's, it's just this uh, different way of thinking about it. I think we've all, we've all, because of these artificial constraints, we've been forced to think about it as zero sum. Exactly. I think I was going to say exact same thing, which is because I think when, uh, you know, when people hear about this theme, the first thing they think about is because I think the two schools of thought, one is you use less, you conserve more, you know, uh, you protect what the planet has and this, since it's limited. And the other school of thought, um, I think we kind of maybe, you know, uh, subscribe more to that is, you know, technology, innovation, you know, all that will help you build out of this. Maybe it takes you to the stars, maybe it takes you to a different planet, but, you know, you're not limited to uh, yeah. the X amount of gallons of fossil fuel that you have today. And then once you run out of it, that, you know, you're, you know, SOL. 
Yeah, I think somebody asked on Twitter, right? Like, what does it mean for it? Was it your threat, Shriram? I think uh, you'd asked about what does it, uh, when you say, what does techno optimism mean to you? And I, re- I, re- I remember one of the answers that really struck me, which is like, th- there are some really hard challenges, but there is this belief that technology will solve them. And there are people who are working on these problems to go solve them. That is what it means to be a techno optimist, where it's not that there are no challenges or it's all solved. It's that, you know, there yeah, as as many as there are going to be increasing number of uh, challenges in our society, technology will like outpace that and solve it faster uh, than there are new problems that are uh, getting formed or created as such, which I thought was like really interesting. Just a little bit on this theme. So let us say we have a race which can live for a few hundred years. Like, what technological developments do you think we need to make? Do we need to go to another planet? Do we need to invent other kinds of energy sources? What do you think we need to do? Okay. Super easy question. I, I that's far beyond my pay grade, but I think the most obvious thing, just even as just like a non um, economist, would would be like social technology. Like, I mean, our, our current societies are not built to accommodate that kind of lifespan. And I think that's you know, if I think about things I'm most worried about, it's how does society change in negative ways from this kind of thing, right? I mean, I, I there's a lot. I mean, like you know, you have an Oppenheimer book on your shelf, right? That's the canonical example of somebody who thought they were saving the world by creating technology and then. You know, we're not like, you know, where's the verdict on that, right? There was obviously a lot of harm that came as well. Um, and I think it's it's something that's like like pretty pretty hard to say. But I, I think one thing that makes me optimistic is, you know, it, it, I think it seems pretty clear that the longer timeline you have to the future that you think you'll live, I think generally the more you're likely to engage in pro-social behavior or, you know, like like imagine the one extreme, right? If you were only to live one extra day, there's everyone always jokes, oh, I do all these hedonistic things or I, you know, do all these things that are more selfish or that are less kind of... Um, I'll finally tell people what I think of about them on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right, but you know, if you knew you're going to see those people on Twitter for 500 years, you know, maybe you'd be, want to be a lot more pro-social. <laughs> I, I, I don't think that's going to make people nicer on Twitter, Laura. I'm sorry. Yeah, I think people will still be the same on Twitter, sadly. Yeah, yeah, you know, I, I, that, 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 that's a that's a fair statement. But yeah, I mean, I, it's a great question, one that um, you know, probably philosophers will will talk, will you know, be arguing about for, for millennia. The other interesting uh, theme is I was looking through. Uh, there's a bunch of like great essays on Edge.org. I think from Boston and others about uh, transhumanism and longevity. And I think one of the interesting things is about memory. Um, you know, how do you think? You know, so let us say we live for multiple decades more. What do you think memories will look like? Can the human brain kind of scale to handle all the new experiences that wind up happening to you? How do you think that might change or not change? I don't know if I can talk about stuff like, or I think it just sounds like crazy to talk. I mean, like, I, like when you start thinking about what consciousness is and like what death actually is and what it means to transition from like consciousness to non-conscious, like, um, yeah, I feel like I would just sound literally crazy trying to say what I... I'm curious what your take is on the singularity, right? Because there's one school, you know, there's one school of thought that, you know, one way the human race winds up living for a long period of time and uh, is you basically, you know, oversimplifying here, but you basically beam up your consciousness into this big AI, you know, running in the sky or some notion of that, right? Uh, what do you take in the singularity? I, I don't know. I mean, I, I I deal with the realm of like atoms, right? Or like, sorry, when I, atoms, like, like just biology. And like, I, I think I, I try to stick pretty hard to priors of like, okay, you know, what are our human instincts telling us? Like our human instinct is generally that like living longer is good. Like we kind of try to protect ourselves. We try to protect people we love from things like death or injury. And it's so like, those are knowns. I think stuff like how can we transfer consciousness to different substrates is like a total totally unknown different to me. topic. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, that makes total sense. I also think uh, it just poses much deeper questions on what does it mean? Like, what is a meaning of life and mystery of the universe? And it just gets like really complex after that. Um, but, you know, I want to switch topics to something that I've been thinking about ever since the first time we met, which is you seem to have this innate ability to believe in something when most other people don't. And why is that? How did that, like, how do you build that skill set, both for like oneself and as you think about like, you know, for us, our kids, like all of that, this is something that we deeply think about. How does it, one get into that that mind state? Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, if you grew up the way that I grew up, you would just believe, you just be that way. Like, you know, I, I grew up 
not going to school. I grew up with no real teachers um, you know, past a certain point for this certain subjects. And um, I grew up going to a lab early. I grew up like going to college at an age when you weren't really supposed to. And like at any given point during any of these, were you like, that's odd. Why am I doing that and not these other kids? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think I grew up with the belief that I could. So that was the important thing is I, I grew up and my dad just really instilled in me this belief that I could I could do anything. Um, and, you know, that, that's a pretty helpful belief. But um, I, I think that I, I it sort of just made me really wary, I think, of um, like conventional narratives because, you know, all my friends who are extraordinarily intelligent, most of them just like ha- default or like, well, I couldn't have not gone to high school. Like, it's just, it's really hard to imagine for them, like at all what that would have been like. Um, so I think it just sort of um, instilled this kind of like wariness towards like default narratives that... Do you ever worry that you would over pivot and always go against the tide? No, because I've seen the downside of that too. So I think one thing I'm obsessed with um, fields that have really bad reputations for non-technical reasons. So I think there's, you know, the most interesting place you can be is a technical field that somehow has required a sketchy reputation yeah. for reasons that like aren't totally merited. And I think a lot of times when that happens, you know, that field becomes like really full of people who can't see past their own viewpoint and they can't like connect to the mainstream. And so it gets farther and farther apart. And they're like, you guys, you don't see we're so it's so important. And then the mainstream is like, OK, that's you're just too excited about this. What's an example of that? I mean, longevity. Like, that's why I'm obsessed with longevity, because I think it's this field that, um, you know, a lot of people feel religiously about. They're like this field is going to save everyone and we need the people to understand. And I think, you know, part of that comes from a good place. Like you're talking about life-saving medical technologies or kind of, you know, things that will at least improve human health. Um, and why is why is there not more work and attention and focus? But, you know, the flip side of that is if you're just a person in the world and you get like a random person coming up to you and like grabbing you by the lapels and being like, pay attention, I'm telling you something really important, right? Like the average reaction is not, I should pay attention. It's like, this person's crazy. And so I think I'm really obsessed with like how how to um, find the important, socially acceptable parts of fields that like may have something to offer and how, how like that ends up, how I feel can transition from like the kind of crazy state to the state where it's at least allowed to, you know, technically compete on its own merit. Like, you know, maybe longevity doesn't work, Great, would love to learn that, but can we like you know can we learn that in a you know scientific context and not just like in a you know social kind of um, popularity context? By picking up something like longevity, um, and it's still controversial, I think, right? Like if you just talk to people about it, but do you ever worry about being socially ostracized or being like, oh man, like I am no longer going to be in this like cool circle of people? Or and I just mean longevity as an example, but in general, like going against the tide and back to that. Do you ever think about, oh, one of the consequences could be like, I am not invited to the cool parties anymore. Because there is a version of Laura who has a very regular Silicon Valley biotech career. You know, you're not working longevity. You know, you're working on very median things. You, you don't seem to be as infected by the need to memetically fit in somehow. And maybe it's your upbringing, but where does it come from? You know, I care about like the truth and like beautiful ideas. I think I, I want to believe whatever is true. And if you want to believe whatever is true, you know, that, that that's not the same thing as what's socially accepted and what's normal believed. Right. And often I feel about these ideas like they're like orphan children. They're kind of like these really beautiful, powerful concepts that have just been like discarded and neglected by society. And so it kind of feels like they need a mother hen to like, you know, it's sort of, it's sort of just like this impulse towards like the beauty of some of these ideas. Like, I mean, it's it's truly extraordinary that we can change lifespan and a model organism. Like it's it's one of the greatest facts of the 21st century. It truly is. And the fact that this is such a um, neglected idea, it's, 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 so, um, it's so avoided for, you know, just social reasons. It like breaks my heart. It's just such a like, um, you know, ideas should be embraced or not on their own terms. They, they shouldn't be popularity, con- you know, they are popularity contests, literally, you know, but like, I, I really don't like when something beautiful like that is neglected for the wrong reason. You just touched on something, which is, I think you talk about how sometimes what gets researched and funded is a popularity contest. Could you talk about that? Yeah, well, I think you're, um, so Alzheimer's right now is kind of a um, very political topic because it's getting a lot of focus and attention as a place where certain hypotheses got popularity for reasons that were, you know, in in part due to kind of um, field dynamics and maybe less on what should 
kind of like what the science would say, although you know, there's a lot of contention around that. I just see this so clearly, like, you know, in cancer, I remember reading this book by Siddhartha Mukherjee on um, the emperor, called The Emperor of All Maladies. And in it, he talks about how cancer in the early 1900s really wasn't that big of a deal to a lot of people. Like, we didn't think of it as this major problem. And it took this enormous social effort of publicity and specifically branding this thing called the Jimmy Fund with a young blonde child that kind of made people really sympathetic to the idea of this kid getting cancer and then, you know, became more mainstream. It took, like, you know, maybe 100 years to get it to where it is today, which is the dominant disease. And I see so many people coming into biology just immediately flip to working on cancer because the big labs do it because everyone else, you know, it's it's the disease that if you beat it, you'll get the acclaim, the kind of status. And of course, also, it's a huge need. But it's, it's just like, it, it's really a social thing. And just, you know, aging, um, like, you know, diseases are social constructs in a sense. And, um, and aging just hasn't had that same, you know, boost yet. And it's, it's kind of this very complex thing. To, it's even more complex than cancer for many reasons, right? In part, we've talked about it's often conflated with death. And so you have all this backlash because of that. And so, I mean, that, I, I just kind of feel like we're in like a hundred year political process to like, you know, shift the narrative around what diseases are and what diseases, you know, are you know, count or don't count. And you're obviously trying to make this happen, but, you know, if you could wave a magic wand, like how would you make people realize that aging is a problem on par with cancer or on par with some of the darkest forces battling humanity? How would you make them take it seriously? I mean, I, I think like make a medicine that, you know, increases healthy, healthy, number, like healthy years, health span, and, you know, make it available to either pets or, you know, people. You know, there are some companies working on these medicines for dogs. And I think that'll be very interesting if that goes forward, right? Imagine having a drug you could just give your dog to make them live longer okay. and, and healthier, right? Of course, you'd, you know, you'd do that if you could, or, or maybe, you know, different people, maybe different situations. But um, that's kind of where we come down. And, you know, because everyone in the field sort of like, well, we've been talking about this for a long time and, you know, no one really cares. So we just have to kind of show that it's actually possible. And then... You know, one parallel I was thinking about, uh, you know, when I was researching this interview is basically the evolution of IVF and, you know, um, you know, back... It's, it's a fairly new phenomenon. It's only happened in 1970. And, you know, before that, thousands of years, if you didn't have a child and that was that. And, you know, very short period of time, you saw, you know, technological advances and, you know, freezing embryos and so on and so forth. Um, and now, you know, it's... It's, it's pretty much considered the norm now, uh, right? Right? Like it's like it's totally accepted um, in many different cultures. IVF is no longer like, oh, that that new unique thing. Yeah, I remember when we were growing up, I think the phrase would be test your baby. Test your uh, baby, uh, yeah. Was, it, was, was the thing. it seemed like a really novel thing then. And uh, now I just feel like it's very normal to talk about it. And uh, it's just more uh, mm -hmm. culturally accepted. Yeah, I think the other ph phenomenon, which we're not there, but hopefully in our lifetime, there's artificial wombs, I think are kind of yeah. interesting. But I do think that sometimes there's kind of like a breakthrough and then it very, very quickly, you know, people like, oh, that thing which we thought of as a hard constraint, like, you know, if my parents couldn't have kids, that was the end of that, uh, but, you know, but now it's no longer like, you know, it's, it, you know, the science can help you with that. I think IVF is a great example because it's already changing my life, right? And I think a big question is how these technologies change our expectations for our own lives. Like when I think about my career, I feel so much more freedom and flexibility. You know, I can have a child at some point, but it doesn't need to be right now. And I can, you know, not make it this, um, such a strong trade-off between the health of my child and, you know, my work and how I want to structure my career. I think of longevity very similarly. Like, you know, if you're age 50, even if these technologies aren't available, if you have the idea that maybe they would be, you know, maybe you will go get that PhD, like maybe you will go back to school, maybe you will go, you know, pursue a career in Hollywood. Like there are many great actors who got their start very late in life, right? That's such a powerful enabling idea. Even even the thought of it, I think, is really um, is really good. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, switching topics completely, and this is only because I'm curious, and you both are now uh, in the world of investing. What is the hardest part about running a fund? Tweeting. <laughs> <laughs> Um, is it, you know, I think, um, raising money, like when I talk to people, you know, one of the things that often comes up is like, oh, I didn't realize like that was a process by itself. Um, investing, how do you invest? And this is something that I've been really curious about because Shriram's now a VC, uh, going from being an operator. So this is something I talk to him a lot about on like, how do you figure out like how, how do you know whether you're good at what you do? I, I think the thing that's been most surprising for me is, um, like or and the hardest is is changing my model of what a great entrepreneur looks like because I think when I first came to Silicon Valley, I basically had watched the Social Network and like my model of 
a great entrepreneur was someone who was really, really technical, laser focused, who spoke in a certain way very quickly, you know, like there are all these things that were just tropes, but I kind of had this model of like, you know, very, very intelligent. And I didn't understand, you know, people skills as also being important or kind of all these other things that if you work, you know, practically in business, you know, are actually the characters of some of the greatest CEOs that are around today. So now after this time, who in your mind or what is the definition of a good entrepreneur? What attributes do you look for? Well, I, I now just see it as a basket of skills that you can have. So you can be, you can have high technical intelligence, you can have high sort of empathetic social skills, you can have kind of a variety of different things. And, you know, the question just like what, how much of each do you have? Mm-hmm. And like what section, what subsets of that basket, you know, do you have? And different entrepreneurs will build different companies. But I, I think probably the hardest thing for me was just learning the difficult way how I couldn't predict you know who would do really well based on like a really simple model and just kind of a, like kind of say like your brain's like a neural network evolving you know like a much more complex set of heuristics for okay it's not that kind of company it's this kind of company and so they'll need this support and they'll like they might work out in kind of this way and since you've been involved in this space for a while is it that when somebody comes and pitches a company to you do you look at it and go I knew that this problem needed to be solved and I'm really grateful that you're finally solving it. Like how much of it is like you kind of know the problem space and there is this right founder team that's now being able to do it versus you get exposed to a totally new problem space that you didn't really know within this realm. And uh, like how much of it is surprise versus like predictable problem meets great team? I would say... um I'm much less about the problem. So, and there are a few key problems in longevity that I deeply care about and I want us to solve. Right. And almost no one's working on those. Everyone's working on kind of the easy, like the. Why is that? I mean, because they're hard problems. Like, we're talking about just incredibly difficult business model questions, like like kind of building companies that have never been built before right. um, to, to solve. And, 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 and I remember because, you know, a decade ago, I started a venture fund in longevity, and that was not a business model that existed then. And so it's like, why did nobody but like a literal teenager start a fund like this? Because like, it, it just makes no sense. You, you have to really care about the, the thing itself to do something like that. And I think in longevity, similarly, that great businesses of tomorrow will be built, but, you know, just... The people who will build them will just be crazy about the problem. Like they, they're not because like the easy thing to do, right, is to pick a pathway that is longevity adjacent and then start a company, a traditional factory company around it that's developing some single asset for that, you know, in a fairly conventional way. And like, not that that's going to likely succeed because you know there's a fixed chance of failure, but like you can kind of just like do a biotech company trajectory that way. You don't have to like change the paradigm of how we view disease, which you know we were talking about. But to build a great longevity company, I mean, you have to change the paradigm of how we view disease. And so you That's have to be hard singularly part. obsessed about a particular problem space. Exactly. Right. And and so that that's kind of... Um, you know, I, I almost look for, like right now, what I'm spending a lot of time doing is looking for great people and then trying to convince them that that's actually a problem that they have any shot at tackling. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And, but pe- great people, entrepreneurs who have the right experience, know-how, like the set of attributes that you mentioned. Yeah, you're kind of the inter- intersection of two interesting ways of, I would say, making great things happen. One is the world of science, and one is the world of Silicon Valley and kind of the VC funding ecosystem. Like, what do you think about that? Like, so for example, is building companies the best way to attack some of these, as opposed to finding other ways to bring capital and energy and motivation to these people? Because it's a very interesting intersection you live in. Yeah, you know. Um I'm so, f- I, I'm obsessed with like the culture clash between East Coast and West Coast cultures. Like, I think it's such a thing. Could you explain so, what Wait, what does that mean? mean? We've only lived in the West Coast, so we have no idea. I think idea. West Coast is just better for the record. I don't even know what it means, but I think West Coast is better. It's such a thing. I mean, I think it dates back to like, you know, the Facebook day or even, even far beyond that. Like, there are these two just totally different cultures. And I know because I, I've literally spent like years of my life going a week in one place and a week in the other place. And it's like East Coast culture is very pragmatic, much more detached. I mean, passionate about medicine and people, but there's just a very specific mentality around um, hierarchy. Like there's a lot more kind of, um, you know, start in a certain place and then you ascend in a certain place um, kind of culture to it. There's a very specific feeling that I I, I know kind of just on the East Coast. And then West Coast culture is kind of like um, fly by the seat of your pants, like 
you want to change the world, of course you can do. Who says you can't? You know, you can do anything you want. This is the West Coast. Um, young people are, I think, much more seen as like, you know, forces to reckon with versus kind of like putting in, in put into hier- hier- hierarchy, which is an incredibly different mentality. And um, I, I think that some subset of that also is reflected in like the difference in, you know, West Coast might have a bit more focus on startups, like where that might be more in the in the culture. And the East Coast, if you, if you look around, right, it's like Harvard and MIT and then like other universities. It's, you're saturated with academics. And I love actually being there because I feel like I have more based on conversations that are, you know, rigorous and interesting. But there's, I mean... Academia has a specific structure in it that, you know, where the idea of just going out to raise startup funding, even for your lab outside of like grants and specifically NIH grants is not a, it's not a thing. Like at a certain, in a certain social strata of academia, in a certain parts of Stanford, right? You're, you get to realize that you can actually just like ask, you know, certain people for money. Like you can ask donors for money. You can, that can be part of what you do at fundraising, you know, as a professor, but most professors don't really think about that. And it's not really part of their world. And I think it just, it's it's like such a and, but there are all these people you know especially in the West Coast who like really deeply want to fund science and like fund interesting you know exploratory work that wouldn't otherwise get funding from from traditional uh, granting agencies and so I just think it's like I'm obsessed with that culture clash and and the opportunities that are left on the table by those two cultures kind of like not being integrated and I think you know like also people in the coast or not sorry this is an overgeneralization but if I were to like hyperbolically say what I th- see happening it's like people in the coast just like hate the west coast because it seems like no one here is rigorous everyone's just like talking you know it's like Theranos is just kind of like the um the the kind of label for everything that happens here and that I think that leaves a lot on the table and it, it kind of conflates like something that was like literally fraud with like something that's like deeply good which is like you know being opportunistic and kind of like giving you know young people an opportunity and kind of like trying to support like people at different parts of their careers um so yeah i, I just i i just think it's such an interesting culture clash that kind of happens i think maybe simpler and maybe we are biased because we spent all of our time in the u.s in the west coast is the west coast just tends to be much more optimistic and maybe optimistic to a fault especially at the valley right like you meet a young person you know in our jobs the mindset that I walk into and we walk into in every meeting, every pitch, and you have to as a VC is like, oh, how is this going to work, right? Like, you know, and these are all the passions. And if you don't know that, you should not, probably not be a VC. And that feels like, quote unquote, a very, I don't think West Coast physically, but West Coast as sort of a state of mind. It's much more of a West Coast thing. Uh, do you believe that or is it different in the world of science? Um, I think it's a really complex question, honestly. Like, I, I think that the East Coast has a much, and sorry, when I say East Coast, again, it's a generalization, but I mean, it's really a thing. I think they have a much better feeling for how ideas are born. You know, like, I talk about this with the folks that are, you know, are some of my closest friends. Like, you know, Steve Jobs went to Xerox Park and he got ideas from researchers, people who were really much more academic in nature. And, you know, those were some of the core ideas behind the products that have shaped Silicon Valley, right? And, like, um, maybe Silicon Valley doesn't give as much credence or kind of credibility to the types of work that actually leads to the ideas that inform the best companies of tomorrow. Um, and so I think that's that's a real gripe or concern. Um, and that's something that I think the East Coast does do better is sort of like have respect for the kinds of deep work that it takes to come up with great ideas. But I think it comes at the cost of, you know, this kind of fly by the seat of your pants, like try much different things. Like, you know, that, that can be really valuable and good too. Right. And it, just kind of those two cultures not seeing how to respect each other really feels like bad and sad to me. Like I wish there was more cross understanding between the two. So if you were a founder who's just starting out building a company, how do you take the best of both worlds then? Like how do you then figure out uh, merging, blending off the two, the East and West Coast cultures? Because clearly both sides, there are like big value adds in how they think about things. Uh, so how do I start a company in the longevity space if I'm a founder getting started and I want the best of both these worlds? Yes, yeah, so I'm obsessed with this question, actually. I think about it like constantly. And I think um, maybe if we rephrase the prompt, it's like, how do you not give up a deep respect for and love for science? You know, like you, how, how do you not give up that um, kind of thinking? There's, there's, I mean, it's a very specific kind of thinking, right? You do when you're in science. It's like creativity. You know, it's dealing with deep subconscious sort of, you know, actions that are really hard to make explicit. And like the kinds of things, you know, like mathematicians go on walks to work, right? They like walk through the woods as like a method of working. And if you're in a startup, you're like, why is my boss, you know, like walking through the woods? You like, you just can't do certain things in typical startup culture that are associated with deep creative work in academia. But, you know, on, on the counterpart, I think that, you know, 
there's kind of in academia this set hierarchy in the social structure of it that startups break and they kind of startups kind of give you a feeling that anything is possible you know and I think it's it's something about that is deeply good um, you know to, to have it and, but but also to combine it with understanding that certain things are physically impossible and one should have deep respect for that and so I think like in my mind it's a it's just a subtle it's like growing a garden or something like if you, if you want both cultures you can have both of those things but you have to deeply want that yourself and and you have to just constantly try and find ways to you know inculcate those booths in, in, in the same in the same place like i think it can be just like a kind of a it's like growing a garden it's like that's a great analogy uh, um yeah. it, the other part i want to talk to you about is you work with a lot of founders and you're obviously a founder of a very unique uh, venture capital firm yourself talk to me about how founders regulate emotion you have ups and downs uh you know struggles to go through um you went through a lot of in, you know hard times when you're out fundraising for the first time and i know this is a topic you think a lot about emotional regulation for a founder yeah i think it's such an interesting topic too because um like I, I think this is an area where you know a lot a lot of people t- have talked about how to make up the deficits that come with um, you know going through hard times. Like let's say you're really sad, and you need to figure out ways to deal with that. Like you know he- here's a set of tools to deal with that. But I think the uh, the kind of just kind of counterpart of that, which is um, if you go through a hard time and you have to get out of it, you come up with out with all these tools that you can then use that become your greatest strengths, right? Like I think that's uh, people have been through hard times can have these superpowers of empathy and self control that you know a lot of folks who are very successful who were just kind of low neuroticism, um, you know, don't have. And, and so I think it's sort of this um, this way to get like a set of a set of tools and skills that that will really uh, serve you and give you the ability to like be more creative in certain ways. Uh, it's actually a fascinating topic uh, um, in terms of like it, 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 like the more hardships you go through, you know, you're better set up because you you've dealt with that before. You know what it feels like, and the next time you hit something, you know, you know your brain is not adapted and you it have goes a framework for it. Yeah, 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 I've seen that before. Or this is not as bad as the other thing when my company actually almost died or whatever the thing may be. Yeah. Um, I think it, it just comes to, like, uh, we call it the founder mindset, right? Like you basically, uh, I, I kind of define it in two ways. One is uh, the ability to think about it as like every problem is kind of solvable. And uh, you can kind of run through walls and make it happen. And I've generally seen that it, like my friends who are like really good founders, they seem to have that like ability, yeah, we can figure it out. And it's the, like, the gnarliest, worst problem ever. They'd be like, yeah, hey, you know what? Like, yeah, I'll sleep, wake up and I'll have a solution. And they'll just like kind of work work away at it and chip away at it Um, that's one and then I think the second thing when I see founder mindset as such is like this uh, ability to uh, kind of sort of have a playbook like you know oh we've seen like way worse things this is like not a problem we can deal with this and kind of always level setting every new future problem with like it's not as bad as that like name like that other horrible thing that happened kind of thing and being able to work off of uh, those challenges to like get yourself and make progress faster I think there's also part of Silicon Valley culture to this where I think Silicon Valley tells you like it's okay to fail and uh, you know I think we all know people who have tried multiple companies or something hasn't worked out and the ecosystem we live in you know believes in giving them the, you know the nth chance so that is definitely this place is more set up for hey it's okay to try something and it doesn't work out we, we're going to help you try again yeah um, so you are 28 now um, you wrote a post on turning 28 uh, and what you've learned and you know, talk to us about how you're different as a person. This might be a kind of a personal question, but whatever you can answer, uh, how you're different as a person, say, compared to a decade ago. Um, what do you qualitatively slash quantitatively know, learn, realize? What do you do differently now? Are there decisions that you would make differently 10 years later versus then? Um, just curious to see how you're processing it in your mind. Yeah, so... I'm obsessed with how we think. Like that's probably the biggest difference. Yeah. Um, is you know I think I was I was over at your guys' house and like ranting to you about this at one point. But like um, you know I, I have friends who are deeply visual thinkers, and what I mean by that when I say visuals, like they will literally see a picture of graphics operating in real time next to my head when I'm talking to them. That's corresponding to the words that I'm saying. They'll be like watching a slideshow animation of like different images. And you know, half people who, like listen to this will be like, "Yeah, I do that." And then half people are like, "What?" Like, I didn't know that was a thing. Um, it was a thing called aphantasia, which is when you can't see anything visually, and actually your whole experience is, is you know, like you you can't imagine someone's face um, that you know very well when you're not looking at a picture of them. 
And so the fact that this is going on all the time, we're not just like collectively obsessed with it, is absurd to me. <laughs> and so I think probably the biggest change has been just obsessively trying to understand and categorize, you know, all the different methods of thinking, and then to really deeply explore in my own subconscious, like, and, you know, also conscious, uh, explicitly how I think and how to come up with great ideas. Because that's really what it's all about. We're right? like, you know, we all want great ideas. We want to find those ideas that just light us up where we're like, this idea is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. And it just, it's like, I think I've, I've just been obsessed the past decade with like all the things you can do to like get there. And to give us an example of some of those things. By the way, you're so right. Like some people who watch this, half the people are probably going to be like, I have no idea what you're talking about. That sounds crazy. And, Shrem, yeah. Do you remember the, the thing with Mark where... Um, what was what is it called? Uh, I forget the name, um, but so we realized we we're very different, and uh, we've been together for a long time. We've only realized this differently, which is, uh, and this is also going to be one of the things which really splits the audience. Uh, uh, most of the human population have an inner voice in their head, uh, or a large set of people do, which is just, you know when you say this white here, there's literally a voice in the head which talks to them. A lot of people don't. I am one of them who doesn't. And we did not realize this was the Which thing. Which blows my mind because all my life, like I remember one of my earliest memories, I think when I was four or five, being like, there is this person in my head. Yeah. This is crazy. What, how is this even? And I looked around, I remember walking around in my uh, uh, daycare, like the, the yard being like, can everybody else hear this person? Like what? And I just like had this mo moment of being bewildered, being like, this is real. But I still remember this all these years later that like that moment of just terrifying clarity that there is a voice inside my head. But all these years later, we were talking to Mark and Jason and Mark was like, yeah, you know, this like inner voice. And I was like, yeah. And Shriram's like, what do you mean? <laughs> I, I, I went on so funny. I went on these big Reddit Google threads and you you realize this, a, that, that all these people in Reddit would be like, what 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 inner voice? What are you what are you folks talking about? You you're pulling my leg, right? And that's how I felt. I swear, I thought Arthi was just making stuff up. And uh, but it it is very much a thing where like and it, you mentioned aphantasia, which is the ability to kind of create this visual uh, imagery. And by the way, closely related is uh, there are some people, and I'm blank on the name right now, but they actually can't picture things in their head. Like if you say, hey, picture a moment from your childhood, but they actually can't do it. And so you, it's a lot of things that we take for granted are actually quite different. Um, but okay, so what, given that you're older and wiser now, Which you know, what are- makes us feel prehistoric. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Uh, but hey, maybe, maybe, you know, we'll all live to a few hundred years. And, I know, you know, it doesn't this, really matter. It's not really zero matter. sum. Uh, get to work faster on all this. But no, uh, what tools, uh, what have you learned? What tools do you now use? Yeah, so I, I remember, um, so Feynman has this quote, right, where he goes, um, if I could transmit one sentence to the future, it would be that everything's made of atoms, these tiny little undividable particles, or maybe they're kind of dividable. But, you know, he, he had this specific quote about atoms and why that would be the one, if you could say anything after an apocalypse to a future generation, that would be the one thing you'd pick. I remember reading that and being like, that's such a boring sentence. Like when I was told, I was like, I mean, like, I, like, sure, you know, but how does that relate to me and my life? And like, did Newton know about atoms? And you know, like, why is that important? And then, um, and I've talked about this a lot, but I, I watched this talk, um, maybe it was like three or four years ago now. So, I mean, this was in my adult life after I, I had concept, like hypothetically, like learned a lot of biology. And it was by this guy, Nima Arkani Hamed. Mm -hmm. And he talks about the idea of units and what units are made up of things. And he gives this example of if you imagine the mass of a star in protons, you just see, it, you, your mind starts to come up with all these ideas of what could be happening in that star, because there, there are a bunch of, you know, of, uh, some types of particles there. And it's, it's just a better, it's a better way to think about things. And I remember having like almost like an altered state experience after like, I literally, I remember I was in Beanback Cafe on the Visadero Street, it was like 8pm or something at night. And I like just like, blundered out of the cafe and I was just like everything has changed like the world is different now and I was like looking at every object like looking at like a manhole cover and be like that's a meter that's 10 to the 10 atoms oh my god like I literally know at a like micro level like a level of, like 10 to the minus 10 meters what's going on there and just being like like mind struck and so that to me is probably the biggest one and that later transmitted into I got obsessed with like this idea that um you know, Tony Stark in Iron Man has like a heads up, he has kind yeah. of like this HDI. Jarvis. Yeah, yeah we, we all want Jarvis, right? Yeah. And I remember watching that movie uh, after this Adam thing happened and I was like, what What if I just put Jarvis, what, what if I could just make that happen but in my imagination, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like, wouldn't that be cool? 
And so one, and I asked, Kenneth, did you have an imaginary friend growing up? <laughs> no, I'm serious. I, I serious don't question. think so. Not that I recall. So, okay. I mean, this is, this is not like some inborn skill that I already had, yeah. but I just kind of I had that thought. And then I, I forget how much later it was, but at some point I remember just like listening to some music and I was dancing around my room and I was just like, I was suddenly I was in a cell and it was just like that. And it's like, I could see, and I was like, oh my God, like I can just imagine there's a mitochondria in front of me and I can like, it's like there. It's not detailed, but it's like the idea of it is specific enough that I can like put con like I, I can like arrange things I'm thinking about in three dimensional space in front of me. And then I was like, oh man, like if I could also memorize a bunch of stuff, my brain could be like Jarvis. Like, you know, if I just onkied all the constants that characterize a cell, I could ask my brain to give me the values for different things and I could like display those in front of me. And then I can manipulate in real time objects in a cell. And I think the the the, the hidden secret in biology is that all the stuff you learn in high school is boring as all get out, right? It's just like these two-dimensional graphs running from physical shapes. It doesn't make any sense. The biology is incredibly beautiful when you can see the actual protein motors and the real stuff that's going on. Like if I could put you in a cell, you would love biology as much as I do in a second. Like I swear, you know, you'd really just... I think he's too big to fit in a cell. <laughs> but that's the thing. In your mind, you can go wherever you want. And so I just, I'm really like... I, if I could spend all my time doing one thing, it would be just continual thought experiments about what's going on in a cell and just thinking about that. And it's so hard because I can say these words, right? Like I heard Feynman say similar things when I was a kid. I just didn't get it. But you know, there's a certain set of things that you just, and you just suddenly it's like, that's the most beautiful thing you could do. And has this helped you unlock ideas or new ways of looking oh, at things? Oh, completely. Like, um, I mean, I, very specific things like I there are certain facts about biology where you know I used to have this concept that like the proton gradient mitochondria has worked a certain way but like just looking at it I was like no it can't be like it, there can't be the, those protons can't be there they just leak out so obviously it has to be the same here and here and the inside has to be less and just just basic stuff like that but also on some deep conceptual level like um it's 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 just a free like I I, I hunt frameworks, you know, like I, I'm obsessed with finding frameworks for thinking that allow you power in different situations. And so framework you can apply to any biological question. Like you can immediately understand kind of where you are, what the magnitudes are, whether something's possible um, for many questions. If you just kind of like ask kind of, you know, if you try and look at things in a certain way. Um, it, 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 I don't want to make it sound like a superpower. Like a lot of people in biology don't think this way, and you know they they have different creative tools. But I think I'm just obsessed with like you know what are what are frameworks that give you power to really find the best ideas quickly and to get to the heart of the situation. And this is one that I found like just super generative in biology. This is kind of strikes me similar to when mathematicians think about visualizing things in n dimensions, and you know there are a lot of like mental tools they use for that. Let me ask you Feynman's question. So if you had to send a sentence in the future, what would you send? Well, now I think it's probably Feynman's sentence. <laughs> like, um, I think that's, and, and maybe I'd add like just something that I think is really beautiful, which is that you know we're surrounded by nanotechnology. Like, I mean, I've, I've ranted to, about this to you before, but you know, when you walk into a forest, like it looks like boring, and it's, I mean, it's beautiful, and you know, obviously it's nature, but you know, it looks like these big hunks of stuff. I mean, you're looking at like trillions of tiny nanofactories that have like more complexity than a city mm -hmm. in each of them that are all together working to make this huge growth in front of you possible, right? That is literally mind-blowing. It's like the most futuristic movies we've ever seen can yeah. begin to encompass that complexity and that beauty. Yeah, and only when we try to replicate something like this, like for me, I love gardening. And for me, it's like no two plants are exactly alike, even if they're like same packet of seeds. And I look at it and go, man, even like, me trying to replicate it, it like the, the it's it's it looks like such a bad cheap replica that you know you really you give more credit to the creator you know you look at it and go wow this takes a lot of work like you know whichever lab this all came up in this is like amazing non trivial yeah <laughs> um, so when you walk into a forest what do you see I I mean I I literally I when I see a tree I literally my mind zooms in and I see suddenly a cell and the cell expands and I see proteins walking around and I. I, I just feel, I see like this nano factor. Like, you, have you ever seen like Big Hero 6, you know, yeah, the yeah, movie yeah. with the kid and the, and the robot? And you know that scene where he's um, he's got all these nanobots around him and he's like telling them what to do? Yeah. I kind of had that sense of scale and power and complexity when I look at a, a, a tree. Because I, I, I know it just, you know, there, there's just this insane like thing happening and if you know biology you can see it but like you kind of have to know the biology to see it it's it's really beautiful by the way if and it's, someone wasn't convinced how passionate you are about biology that little bit you know will tell them like how much you love this space um 
I want to change topics from biology to math because you have some really interesting ways of building intuition about numbers in biology. And also maybe, let's have a simpler question. What makes certain numbers beautiful? Or talk to us about mathematical aesthetics. <laughs> well, I, I'm excited to, for context, I am like a math neophyte. Like, you know, if you are an actual mathematician, like listening to this, like it's sort of just like, like absurdly like, like my knowledge of mathematics in a, a deep sense is like, you know, absurdly, absurdly um, small and tiny and very humble, uh, very aware of that. Um, but like, you know, I it just, I mean, there's, there's so many things about math that I never understood when I learned it in high school, right? Like um, people would always talk about, or like, like, like one intuition I used to have was that, you know, um, real numbers were better. I was like, okay, if you give me an integer or like, you know, a real number, real numbers are just better because they're more real. It's like, you know, the world's continuous, you know, or I'm, I guess we don't know actually. It's an interesting I think point. that was just like a really bad branding to call something <laughs> real numbers. Yeah, I mean, it sounds good, but also in my mind, it's sort of like, you know, integers are kind of like a subset, you know, uh, there's like a you know, smaller set than the real, the real numbers. This is the dot zero of the real numbers, right? Exactly, so right. real numbers are just better. And then um, I remember talking to this very, very, uh, just a wonderful person who I know who, you know, has spoken to me math about mathematics, you know, sometimes. And he was kind of, he pointed out that mathematicians are actually deeply suspicious of the real number line because what the hell is going on there, right? Like if I give you a real number line, can you actually find a real number on it? No, there's literally no way in the real world to find like a real number on a real number line because like you, you know, if it's, if it's infinitely precise, we don't, ha I mean, there's, there's no tool in the world that we'll ever have that will allow you to put your finger on or like, you know, put a specific, you know, point on a point that corresponds to a real number that you want to target. In a very weird way, they kind of like don't exist or they're impossible to access in the real world. It's like tree falling in a forest kind of thing. Yeah, and, and like the idea of them is great. And, but, and you point out that like integers are great. We start out with integers. Like integers are so much better. They're so much easier to understand. Your discrete space is, yeah. is so, it's like, you know, you can count and that's it. You know, you, you know the number, like the, you know the number, that, that's great. I, I love your blog where you talked about turning 28 and you're like, I love this number. Yeah. And uh, and you talked about, I, I love triangle numbers too. I think they're just cute. You know, I just have fun like sketching them out. Uh, but then you were like, uh, it's a sum of primes, the first few primes, non-primes, and integers. It's a, it's such a great number. Well, so that, that's the other thing, which is, which is uh, kind of going back to your question and bring that up. It's like, um, another thing that I didn't used to understand was like, why are people so obsessed with primes? And, you know, obviously, if you're mathematician, you're like, that's it's the simplest question ever. But when I was a kid, I was just like, maybe it's like trading cards. Like, they're just kind of, you know, hype, like a cool thing to know. And, you know, like, but why would I care? And then I remember, again, this is a similar person made a, made a point to me that, um, you know, like classify, like characterizing a number by how many it takes to get there on a real number, on, an, on like an integer number line. It's just weird. Like it's so arbitrary. Like why does the fact that it takes a hundred steps to get a hundred, why should that be the core character of the number? He, like when I think about 28, right? It's like, is it the fact that it's like 28 steps to get to 28 that's like really important? Or is it the fact that it's like maybe the only number that we know of um, that, you know, is a triangle number, is the sum of the first n, like integers, sum of the first n primes, sum of the first n non primes. Like those are such maybe cooler facts to associate. Like the number that has those properties is kind of like a, maybe a cooler way to describe this number 28. And I just remember like being my, and now I love primes, right? Like primes are awesome. Like I could sit down and like, you know, figure out primes all day. Um, or, you know, just like, the, like, like in the first couple hundred numbers at least. But, um, you know, that just stuff like that, that you, you don't realize and then you see it and you're like, wow, that's just amazing. Uh, you know, the thing which really, uh, by the way, I'm not a math person. Arthi is very much a math person, but I'm not. But the one thing which made me really fall in love with primes as a kid was the book and then the movie Contact. Um, Wait, uh, I thought you were going to say Rendezvous with Rama, but okay. Well, Rendezvous with Rama, I think has... For doing, the number three? No, doing number things in threes, right? And it's kind of a redundancy thing. Yeah. Um, but in Contact, um, you know, uh, spoiler alert, but the way the plot works is, you know, humanity picks up a broadcast from what's seems like an alien civilization um, and there are multiple layers to this broadcast but the core the more the simplest layer basically being like hey this is from an intelligent race pay attention is they basically sent primes right. right and it's seen as um, the two things I remember like one is this idea that it is such a fundamentally universal mathematical thing which has to come from somebody intelligent um, which I think was very very interesting and the second I think uh, the contact uh, introducing the word numinous, mm -hmm. which is this feeling of awe that you feel uh, when you look at concepts like this. So I think which you've been describing for um, this one, but that's my little history with primes. <laughs> um, okay, so, um, all right. So 
talk to us about mathematical intuition around biology because that's the other thing which I think you know you have some really strong skills at. Yeah, so I'm, I'm gonna so you know mathematics is a whole wild discipline that I just in my mind it's like art or something that I barely understand and that that's that's not when I talk about quantitative biology, like complex mathematics is just a totally different like like those are cr- you know crazy people doing that stuff and I would like hope in my lifetime to have an inkling of like what they're up to and you know I'd spend some time trying to understand that stuff but just like that's different from quantitative biology. Quantitative biology is using very, very simple mathematical tools to do like crazy cool thought experiments in biology. The, the, the cool thing about mathematics, you don't need a lot of math to get incredible results, right? You just need a little bit to get started. And so in biology, um, I'd say the logarithmic scale is the most useful thing, right? It's like this idea of, you know, you can jump up and down powers of 10 as easily as counting on a number line. And like, you really can't, like, you have a logarithmic scale, you just like move one to the right, one to the left, and it's like you're going up and down. And, I do a specific thought experiment with a lot of people who want to think about biology where you kind of walk through, okay, imagine that you put your arm in front of you, right? And, you know, maybe if you had a longer arm, it'd be like, you know, half meter or something or that scale. And then you can kind of close your eyes and leave your arm there. And then you can imagine um, uh, sort of putting a hand next to your arm. And then you can imagine like, if I zoomed into my hand, so it was as big as my arm used to be, okay, just like kind of seeing that, and then you put your thumb next to your hand, you do it again, and you put your finger next to your thumb, you do it again. And if you do this 10 times, you get down to an atom. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. interesting. Yeah, and so cool. you, if you have even just like basic pictures of what different cellular concepts look like, you can do this mental exercise where you're zooming into a picture. Have you ever seen the, the video Powers of 10? No. Uh, no. It's this amazing video where they do this in like a video. You know, they, they they zoom down from someone's hand all the way down to like you know an atom. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, and you can kind of see it visually. But the point is, if in your mind you can transition between scales, length scales, that easily, that's what allows you in a thought experiment to jump up and down and to kind of like okay, you know, if cells doing this okay here, if I zoom out two length scales, like what would that correspond to with magnitudes be? And so I think like that fluency with like a logarithmic scale, it's a very basic thing. You know, it doesn't require complex math or advanced mathematics to be able to use, but it just gives you incredible power, especially if you combine it with like visualization. I just love this. Um, and how would you, you know, if you had to go back and you had to teach young people math in school, like how would you infuse? all the such an evident love that you have for this topic into them well in math i i would defer to the you know inc- incredible mathematicians that i like I, i'm lucky to know a little bit whatever they said to do it's it, i i would say I, I like i barely understand how addition works on some deep level you know like like when people talk about addition like that i used to be like oh, that's the dumbest thing ever I mean, but you guys were talking about earlier right like with, with indra how for her the idea of subtraction is just like kind of weird she's like well we're you know you have five where bananas go? Yeah. where do the two bananas go <laughs> yeah that's a great question you know and like when you're a kid you just get t- told okay like let's move on to the next stop like, asking okay there are no more bananas yeah exactly but i mean like, like think about how long it took us to come up with the idea of like subtraction and negative numbers right it took us a a long time. I mean, that was a, that was a real innovation, yeah. and the fact that we just kind of teach that like it's a basic, obvious thing. I think that's like you know, that's that's a conceptual leap. That really, if you start to think about it, it's this whole like wor- the whole like world of 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 just like of of um. It's really not obvious, you know. Even though we treat it like it is, and so I'd say, you know, that, that that's something. I'm not sure if I teach kids that, but that, that that's something. I'd say on the biology front, one thing I'm obsessed with today is the idea that like visualization will change how biology is taught. Like I think that there is basic videos of cells that have made millions of people love biology mm-hmm. in a way that's just really obvious and simple and natural. And so I think like if I again like if I could put you in a cell, I think you'd love biology as much as I do. And like with our technology today, in a couple decades, we should be able to do that. You know, in teaching tools a lot more beautifully and regularly than we do today. Do you think? Uh- like stuff like mRNA and people just getting to know what that means and with what all that has happened with COVID the last couple of years kind of pushed that a bit forward because I feel like, you know, I've seen enough TikTok videos now where I'm like how mRNA works and uh, how it uh, attacks. Do you think that's kind of pushed the frontier or not at all? I'm much more drawn to things like, you know, the magic school bus with Mrs. Yeah. Fritz, yeah. you know, she like, I think if you could do that for biology, really, if I could, if I literally had a magic school bus, it would just be obvious that you should love. I mean, because you want you if you go inside a cell, you'll see things walking around that look like people. Like one of the most compelling things you can see as animation is like this idea of a, is, is a picture of a protein that's walking around and it looks like a person or a protein that looks like a literal pump that you would build. Like it, it, these are proteins that like you know are spinning. Like they're using like you know principles of like physics mm-hmm. and mechanics to do these tasks. And you're like that's a machine. Like that's a nanobot. Like when you have that moment, I think that's when you really get into 
of biology. And so just like having magic school bus would be... Uh, you should... I don't know if you've seen this late 80s movie called uh, Inner Space, uh, uh, if not. So, no. Uh, so uh, the concept, and you know, this really kind of helped me understand the human body when I was a kid, but the basic concept is uh, they miniaturize a real submarine um, and they basically send it into the human body and there's this team which has to kind of go up the bloodstream and you know perform some surgery of uh, some kind, right? But actually, it, it, I remember I was maybe like six or seven years old, but it really teaches you like what happens in a vein, what happens in an artery, and it's definitely a very different level of scale than what you're talking about, but the visceral and it's kind of a Hollywood plot line and that people would die and you know some somebody gets eaten by i think a white blood cell or something and uh so uh what? It, it's quite dark and i was five so i was very traumatized about white blood cells for a while uh my parents made some very questionable content choices for me but uh but there was every level of visualization make it very visceral and um real um uh, we should watch it. I don't know where you were going with that, but I just Wh- feel like you scarred cells. a bunch of people. White blood cells eating a human being, I think, was what I remember from that. Yeah. And also, spoiler alert, I now I cannot watch that movie without knowing what happens. Like, who gets eaten by the white blood cell? I'll try and make you watch it. It's so obvious that longevity is kind of your life's work. But in alternate time, if you were not doing this, or if you suddenly had two extra time, what would you what would you work on? Like I said about ideas and beauty, I, I just want to experience like the most beauty in my life that I can possibly experience, you know, like, isn't that all kind of like, you know, what on some level, like the, the most depth and to share that with others. And I know that even in mathematics, I could spend, you know, multiple lifetimes and not even begin to see like the most beautiful sights that there are to see there. Um, and so I think, you know, I would just spend all my time trying to do stuff like that and, and then build interesting stuff with my friends. But like, um, yeah, I just, I'm just obsessed with like beauty and ideas and like, you know, being able to see like, you know, just really, really incredible things. It, it's so simple and yet so profound. It's just, it, it it's just beautiful because I think I kind of expected you to be like, well, I wanted like, there are other problems to go solve. I want to go solve them. I want to help humanity. But I think all that will come when you find you when you look for beauty in the things that you're doing on a day-to-day basis which i think is really deep and profound and yet so simple yeah i mean trying to find beauty. i don't think there's like a probably a better note for us to yeah laura this was this was an absolute blast you know we've had you home a couple of times before and um you know you've been on the show too but doing this here in person and just getting to talk to you about everything from just math and numbers to walking into cells, visualizing it. It's just, it's such a blast. And, you know, we've had such a great time here. Uh, so thanks so much for coming on the show. Oh, thanks. Guys. And, and I love your books, by the way. Like, Prince and Companion of Mathematics is such a great one Th- for that the That was Shriram's really. gift to me. <laughs> I'm not a math person. So Arthi has some really crazy math skills. Uh, so uh, No, um, I don't. Yeah, like, I'm going like, to just broadcast the internet. So she can weirdly remember numbers of things. So, like, she She'll remember like every license plate number of a car, you know, you know, this ever like a foreign intelligence agency trying to track us, they're going to have a hard time with her. So yeah, I'm like crazy arithmetic skills. No, no, no. no. Uh, 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 so Wait, what's your favorite number, by the way? Well, right now it's 28. I mean, obviously, oh, right. but <laughs> uh, I, I, I love it. Well, first of all, belated happy birthday. And, uh, you know, I mean, you're enthusiastic me energy and, you know, it's just mind blowing. And I'm pretty sure anybody watching this is going to visualize themselves in the cell and really get into biology. So awesome. on that note, thank you so much. This was amazing. Yeah, thank you, thank you guys for having me. Uh, thanks so much.